Welcome to Align to Your Design. I'm your host, Beth Davis. Isn't it time to wrap your business around your purpose and bring your greatest work to the world? Each week, join me as we explore various biometric tools, such as human design and hand analysis, and how to use them to fulfill your destiny and align to your design. We will reveal how to do the work you are designed to do, rather than what you think you should do. Hey everyone, welcome to Align to Your Design. This is the place where we meet individuals who are living their purpose, they are aligned to their design. They're doing meaningful, impactful work in the world. And then, of course, we wrap up each interview, permission allowing, uh, looking at our guest's human design chart and one specific area of their life and how that shows up in their human design so they can be even more aligned to their design. I'm so happy to be with you today. I'm very, very excited about our topic. And I'm going to introduce our topic and our guest right now to you. Uh, What we're going to talk about today is this expression, painting over rust when relationship rebounds derail your recovery. And our guest today is the powerful, loving, and deeply enjoyable spiritual teacher, Barry Selby. He is a passionate champion for the divine feminine. He helps strong, successful women create balance in love, life, and business. Barry awakens women to own and express their feminine majesty, we like that, in love and in the world. Barry helps his clients heal their hearts, sourcing their own love and support so they may fully embrace their magnificence and help these women attract relationships that are equal with who they really are. As a masterful relationship attraction expert, Barry is affectionately known as the love doctor to his audience with over 35 years of training and experience, including a master's degree in spiritual psychology and 22 years as a spiritual counselor. He's helped thousands to learn to love themselves and live in wholeness. He brings deep compassion, gentle masculine strength and presence, and wise guidance to assist his clients in their journey to true love. He is an in-demand inspirational speaker standing for love, healthy romance, and deeply passionate relationships. And with that, let us bring on our incredible guest, Barry Selby. Okay, I'm bringing him on the show. Barry, Barry, welcome. Thank Hi. you. Hi. That's quite, I feel like an intro, even though I know I wrote the intro, it sounds so nice hearing it back to me. Yeah. I feel like, wow. <laughs> yeah, kind of impressive there. It's, and it's the truth, just to be honest. I'm not like making stuff up. That is oh, quite something. So, you know. Would I have someone on this show who made <laughs> stuff up? How long have we known each other? We've known each other, what, a decade? It's where did be we something first, like that, yeah. Where did we first meet? We met at like a, where did it was we a, meet? Maybe it was I'm trying to remember group? that too. It was yeah. a mixer or something. It was, it was some sort of meetup group meeting. Some sort Yeah, of some kind of mixer. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, I'm so happy to be with you today. So share with all of us, what do you mean by painting over rust? Uh, yes. It's actually come up recently in some of my talks. And for those who don't know, I, I, I've been very um, busy on Clubhouse since the app came out, which is an audio app, which has really helped me clarify some of my messaging. And painting over rust came through as one of my descriptors, because what I recognize people do is in relationships, especially, or should say when they break up in relationships, for many people, and I did the same thing, so I know the pain of this, is rather than face what happened, it was like, what's next? How can I move on? And it's kind of the idea of when you paint over rust, because I had this visual of you know, painting a, a, a car um, panel, but not cleaning the rust off first, and watching the paint bubble as the rust came through. And that's the way what happens in relationships, in terms of the fact that we don't clear out the old stuff, it won't go away, and it won't stay hidden. It will start to come back through again. So it's important, I believe, to, I wouldn't say clean, clean up the mess, but definitely do the self-reflection after breakups before you go forward to the next relationship. You know, I had a dream. This is so crazy you're saying this. I had a dream about someone I had dated who drove up in their car, which I know had been in a car accident many years before. They don't even actually have this car anymore. But in the dream they did, And they had just restored the car, but not really. It was duct tape back together. 
and they would painted over it in this charcoal matte black you know primer kind of gray black primer mm. and you could see the rust and the <laughs> the bubbles through the paint and i remember waking up from the dream and he opened the door for me would you like to go for a drive and for some reason i was like okay is it safe and he's like yeah and I think he even put the seatbelt on me. And I was like, okay. And then we drove off into the sunset. We didn't speak a word to each other after that. So I don't really know what, what the, the dream means, you know, in my future, if anything. But when I got up and I wrote about the dream, Barry, I actually wrote down that this person was in some kind of repair work, but they'd done like a, you know, a slapdash job of it. Right. And they were trying to, you know, woo me back in the dream but they hadn't really finished the restoration of the vehicle, which is themselves. I mean, that, that dream explains everything. <laughs> everything. I mean, that dream could not be more obvious, could it? And it's sort of right. like, it's sort of someone else's soul saying like, I'm trying to get it together, but I'm not quite there yet. The car runs, but it needs to get a real full body work job done. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> I love the visual. It's funny, there's a meme that I saw going around and I actually posted it once and then realized I shouldn't do that and took it off again. It was something the lines where it shows a picture of this woman sitting on this stack of steamer trunks and suitcases and things. And it's something about uh, wait for the one or look for the one who's going to help you unpack your, your baggage. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not their job. No, it isn't. Ew. <laughs> so, Go unpack so, your own damn baggage. Exactly. Ugh. So that so that yeah. that dream you had definitely resonates in that experience because yeah I again, love it yeah because yeah. the thing is we have this thing and this thing is sometimes dreams are very foretelling or at least explaining what's really going on where you didn't necessarily think about it consciously but then in the dream you go oh now I understand mm -hmm. is that we do have this thing where we look at something I won't say through rose tinted spectacles but certainly through that lens of like it could be okay but part of you knows better but you won't trust that part that knows better yes absolutely so what would you say are maybe the top three issues that women come to you with in terms of embracing their divine feminine and if you want in i am asking a lot all at once i tend to do that <laughs> if you'd like to throw in there an explanation of what the divine feminine is and then three different ways that women block obstruct or you know in some ways don't take ownership of their divine self well let me start with some of the issues that women great with in quotes one of which is, and I've talked about this in other talks, how we're in a very patriarchal structure in the business world, especially women who have gone out to work in the business world, because that's what women were allowed to do starting back in the 60s, so to speak, they would embody what men were doing. And so mm -hmm. the divine feminine would get suppressed or ignored once they went to work. And then they start dating or go to happy hours and meet men, but they haven't disengaged that part and they're still running the same male way of doing things, which is the hunter type method mindset. Mm -hmm. So a lot of women, I mean, I was the receiving end of this a few times, would ask the men out, would lead, would take charge. And so there was no room for the man to be in his masculine. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, some of the men didn't deserve to be, well, I'm going to be careful, careful I say this. <laughs> a lot of men haven't owned their masculine either. So there was kind of disparity as well. Right. So that's one piece. The second piece is a lot of women, I'm aware of certain clients I've worked with, didn't know what that was to own their own feminine. They somehow thought being feminine was weak because the word the world has taught them is that men are stronger than women. Therefore, women should try and be more like the men to be stronger. That was like a mm. subconscious programming that we're getting. Wow. And the third, third piece is also is, is a lack of trust of men. I mean, so many women I, I know have gone through bad relationships, had experiences, whether it was even from family dynamics, where it was abuse or neglect or just disrespect, that they weren't feeling they could be trusted, they could trust the men they were with. So that's kind of three areas I work, I, I seem to see a lot in my with my clients and audience. The divine feminine, and I talk about this in so many different ways, but one of the things I say is, you know, recognizing that the feminine is actually way stronger than the masculine, just to be really clear. And I'm of saying course. this as a masculine yes. man. Of course, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> well, yeah, it is called mother nature, not father nature, first of That's all. Right. That's right. <laughs> just to be clear. Thank you. Yes, thank but, you. And also, I mean, I don't think any man would ever handle a childbirth, just as <laughs> also. So I recognize that women had the physical and the, um, the fortitude to handle a lot more pain the men can just so true but the other part is is that our culture hasn't talked one how men need to be more masculine versus macho and our whole thing about toxic masculinity isn't actually a misnomer it's not really true it's toxic machoism frankly 
but the women haven't been shown that the feminine is also one worthy, deserving, and where they, they thrive more powerfully. There are a few women out there doing this. I know a couple of friends of mine who are very um, aligned to their feminine nature and their feminine leadership, and they teach other women to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the hill saying, ladies, please do that. We need, we need you to do that. Yes, you know? we do need women to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and so the feminine energetic is, I mean, the ways in simple terms is the feminine is movement. It's life yep. force. It's the light of expression, of exuberance. The masculine uh, being the yin and yang, the opposition, so to speak, or the opposite is more stillness and presence and depth. And in some ways, the, the true essence of masculinity is the depth, almost of death itself. It's so infinite, but in a very clean and a very um, solid place. Whereas the feminine is the movement of energy that moves around everywhere. So mm. this, this, the two work together in terms of the yin and yang type methodology. But for what women can do, you know, in, the way things are set up is that masculine is more directional focus. The feminine is more uh, witnessing and able to include some of the other pieces too. Right. So there's lots of different, different pieces of the, two, of the two polarities. And when women own their feminine, I believe, they discover much more power they have, but not from a place of like pushing power, but a more embracing power. Yes. So that's just part of it. Um, one analogy I've used, or should I say met metaphor analogy, one of those two, <laughs> that I was taught by one of my teachers is that the, the feminine is like a really powerful river running down the hillside towards the ocean. Mm -hmm. Very strong directional flowing through the, rip, the, through the forest. The masculine is the river banks that create structure. Right. And the feminine has the river. But the truth is, those river banks don't contain the river. They create structure because the river can burst the banks pretty much any time the river gets full. So women have to remember they have that much power. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that we can serve that as men. So it's not about us controlling. It's about us supporting and creating the, the environments where the feminine can thrive. Yeah, I like that. Now, do you think that there are more women statistically that are awake to their path than men at this point in history? Or, or do you I, think it's 50-50? I strongly suspect more women are waking up to this, frankly. I mean, my own experience, I've, I've been, say, been in the personal development field since the mid-80s. I would say almost every single seminar I was in, there were more women than men in the room. Mm -hmm. So I've always become aware. I mean, it's one of the secrets, the fact that there were more women than men in these environments. But the recognition is that mo more women have been fascinated or driven to or curious about personal development, about transformation, about spiritual learning than men have been over the years. So I believe mm -hmm. more women are certainly aware of and awakening to what femininity is than men are towards masculinity. And partly because, and this is also something I remember talking about a long time ago, is that you know the last part, um, segment of the population who has never done any work or transformational reflection of themselves is the straight white male. Yeah, because right. Because they wouldn't have told us anything wrong with them. Well, no, they were. Well, they well, of course not, because they set up the structure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a self-referential structure. It wasn't, uh, exactly. you know, a self-correcting structure. It right. was a dominator structure. We're in charge and the rest of you are all our peons. And now that's yeah. coming unglued. Very much so. I mean, the, the, apart. the need for a matriarchy is getting much, much stronger, in my view. And, well, you know, I. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm no, going to no, interrupt right. you because one of the thoughts, I just want to throw this into the ring. One of the terms I've learned from human design from Richard Rudd, who created the Gene Keys, is this concept of synarchy. And synarchy is when the matriarchy and the patriarchy, they rule together. Ooh. And it's not like the divine feminine is awakening because she's been asleep. She's been repressed. Yeah. Now, she participated in the repression. But men and women all have a life purpose, right? This is my whole argument. Like, we're not a role. You know, we're not maids and whores and mothers exclusively. You know, we actually are fully, fully comprehensive beings. And um, that's what's coming on. And I, and I also think that men have a divine feminine that they're deeply out of touch with. So what yes. I've seen as the poison of patriarchy is that it, it's impacted everyone across the board. The men are confused about their role. They don't know how to be masculine, whatever that means. They confuse it with machismo. Um, they're not able to express their feelings. And frankly, most of the dating advice to women is all about how to coddle and tiptoe around men. I mean, you'd think if you give a man feedback or you offer him some criticism, I mean, granted, not unsolicited, but if you say to a man like, hey, do you want some feedback? And they're like, yeah, and then you tell them and then they retaliate passive aggressively 
for the feedback they said they wanted. I'm like, what are we five years old? Like, this is where I get exasperated. So I'm like, let me get this straight. I got to walk around a man's ego because it's made of eggshells. Like if I, if I say one thing wrong, he's going to be, oh my God, she's trying to control me. And then, you know, the women to their side, they are kind of clueless about men. <laughs> True. Right. They go into these dating things and they're just sleeping with guys. And like, I'm like, these guys aren't going to call you back. What are you doing? They're like, well, you know, I really want a long-term thing with him, but he's just not committing. I'm like, well, you're having sex with him. They're like, yeah. I'm like, well, that's doomed. Stop having sex with him and tell him you want a committed relationship. And you're not having sex with him until he tells you he wants to commit a committed relationship. And if he doesn't, then go find someone else. I mean, this isn't rocket science, but I want, I'd like wonder is it just me? Like the exasperation you hear is obviously from my own experience and talking to men and women. And it seems that most of the men and women I talk to are pulling their hair out, just trying to have some basic intimacy, like good sex and the ability to converse about whatever's going on without it becoming some stupid fight. I'm like, why is this so hard? And you know what's so hard? It seems like everyone, humanity is not in touch with their feelings. I don't know. I mean, is it me or it, that's what I'm seeing? Well, so, so a couple of pieces I want to put into the conversation because I agree yeah. with you absolutely. Yeah. Is that yes, um, all all of the population carries masculine and feminine energy as well. I, I sort of look at it as being like a spectrum between masculine and feminine, right. sort of hundred percent masculine on one end, hundred percent feminine on the other end. Exactly. We all live yeah, somewhere in between. In between. Yeah. yeah. Somebody's right in the middle on 50 50 is basically androgynous. It has no real polarity either way. So they're not particularly sexually attracted to anybody. It's kind of the unfortunate place if you live there, which is you don't care. But we live somewhere on that spectrum. So a man who's in his masculine is probably running 70, 80% masculine and then 20 or 30% mm -hmm. feminine. And a woman who's in a feminine is probably the inverse of that. So we do carry both. And depending on what we're doing requires one of those different polarities. You know, driving a car, being directional is more masculine energy, whether mm -hmm. you're in a male or female body. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're nurturing a baby, again, independent of your body, physical gender, you're probably more in your feminine. Mm -hmm. If you're doing and there's other tricks, I mean, the way that the masculine and feminine expresses is something we haven't really talked about for a long time, and we've been denying it. Some of my favorite teachers explain it in ways that I love to use for reference. And so when we recognize we carry both, it gives us more freedom. Mm -hmm. And yes, conflating masculine with macho is a big mistake. The way I've described it oftentimes, and I'm not talking about my chakras, but talking about just the way it physically seems to express is that macho men are basically neck up and balls in the way the physiology is it's like you know it's like sexual drive but with the ego from the neck up running the show trying to get things done totally selfishly like my way the highway whereas the masculine is more of an open heart and a strong spine mm -hmm. so it's directional it's clarity it's also compassion and caring so even though it's obviously including everything but that sort of separation of those distinct energetics for me explains why masculine and macho are very different and why toxicity belongs in the camp of machoism because it's so ego driven because masculinity in its true state is never toxic. It's about service. Right. right. Yeah. You know, in my, in my own human design chart, my outer personality to interact with other people is, is much more yang masculine than my design side. My, my personal life, my physical body, my, who I am as a person is much more feminine. And I actually did a Carol Allen, who we both know, she, yes. uh, she gave us a quiz. I was at one of her workshops and she gave everyone a quiz and it was the yin yang quiz. And I was wondering how I would do on it because when I'm out in the world, I've had primarily men, not women. I've had men say to me, oh, you know, you're so in your masculine. You're so blah, blah, blah. I'm like, my life purpose is called the general. I don't know what, there's nothing higher than the general. I don't know what to tell you. Everybody right. follows the general and I got five stars and get in line. <laughs> um, it's how I'm wired. I, I, what are you going to do? And then, you know, I'm a pussycat in my personal life. I'm totally different. And so I took this yin yang test and sure enough, I was 85% yin and 15% yang. And Carol said to me, I'm not surprised. She said, you're very feminine. The way you orient to people, the way you connect with people, the community, you know, you're very nurturing, et cetera, et cetera. You're open with your feelings. You, you know, you're good with boundaries. Like you, you, you're very feminine, but the delivery the presence yes. <laughs> is very strong and I don't suffer fools. Like I can't, so many men are intimidated by my intelligence. You saw it happen on that call we were on. That happens oh, yeah. to me all the time. People try to shut me down. They make little digs. They make fun of where I went to school because they're jealous. And I'm just like, oh my God, help us all. Like women are just as intelligent as men. 
We all have things to share here. And so this is really my personal, you can tell, I have some angst about this. I need yes. your help, love doctor. <laughs> what is the deal with this fragile eggshell ego of the masculine? Like I can't, I am not going to rearrange myself. So some guy isn't like emasculated because I asked him a question or he asked for my input and I said, okay, here's my input. And then they don't talk to me for three days. I'm like, you need to grow up because I, or just don't ask me, or I won't tell you even if you ask me, but I, I am just baffled by this because so, you don't seem like you have an eggshell <laughs> ego. I've, I've been through enough to learn. <laughs> well, Good. So, Thank you for that, getting a, ba a steel spine and an open heart. Thank but, you. That's what I want to see. That's masculine to me. Not yeah. this wimpy, I want to be a man. I'm so masculine, but a woman says one wrong thing and they're like crying in their cups. I'm like, what is going well, on? For me, emasculation is an indication there was no masculinity in the first place. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Thank you. I feel very vindicated by that. <laughs> well, yes. that's the thing is because the macho... Yes. The macho is a shell. It's a it's shell. A it's fake. Shell. Right. It's so, fake. so it is something. That is, so also because it's a shell, the need to protect it becomes overt. Yes. About the other and then controlling the other and right. making and the other that, wrong. And presenting as a certain look. I mean, er, those people who have all the all the accoutrements of, of looking good. Red flag. Sometimes are in the, are in, the, in, the, in the macho because that's the ego trying to say, look at me, look what I've done. And none of it really has solidity. It's all just, it's house of cards. A masculine man is somebody who is who knows who he is in his depth. And frankly, the accessories around him come and go. And it's like, no big deal. Yeah, it's yeah, nice he, to have he, the nice things, but it's not like right. it's actually must have them. Right. And that's the difference. Again, because it's not ego driven. Right. And for me, my path, because I must have been on this path for a long time, was hard work first. I don't I only really discovered the masculine part back in 2007. So the last 15 years of my work has been really discovering how to live in my true like direction, clarity, and purpose. Up to that point, I was always just doing the open heart spiritual work. Mm. And so, to be honest, in my relationships back in the, well, 20, 30 years ago, I was the nice guy because I had open heart and no spine, no clarity, no direction. Right. So I was kind of wishy-washy. Oh, yeah. Well, was, you know, know, yeah, those guys will get eat for lunch, too. I was. <laughs> I mean, I can't tell. I just can't stand either one. I can't be around it. Like the wimpy guys, the nice guys are the most dangerous because they're so manipulative. And they use guilt and manipulation, like, but I'm such a good guy. I'm like, no, you're not. And then you have you have the macho guys who are also dangerous, but for kind of a different reason. They can even be physically aggressive. Mm -hmm. And I have a theory about this. I want to run by you because you're a man. So I was thinking, mm -hmm. we li we've lived in patriarchy for 5,000 plus years, which means that males are valued more than females. Mm -hmm. we've diminished the feminine look at the planet we've just raped mother earth there's plastic in every fish in the ocean it's trash everywhere we've we're extincted what 40 percent of our species since the 70s way to go um so a lot of imbalance and what i'm what my theory is is that because the masculine is mar valued in a patriarchy more than the feminine that mothers and fathers to some degree, but mostly mothers, because they're usually the primary caregiver or a grandmother or auntie. It's usually the women in the family. They spoil these boys like they're little king tuts. And that's why I think they have fragile egos because they grow up to be adults and they think women are gonna just cater to them, like do their laundry, feed them, coddle them, never criticize them, never have a complaint, never say, buddy, shape up, like what's the deal? Like they just, you know what I mean? And I don't know yeah. if I'm right about that or not, but you know, in a lot of cultures, especially India, China, Japan, I mean, women, they'll just leave them on a hillside to die. So the West is slightly better in its, you know, and how it treats women, but not a lot. And so I just wonder about this, that there's, there seems to be this kind of entitlement. And as a result, a real uh, shallowness and superficiality and inability to handle conflict, handle yeah. feedback and be really brave. You know, when I think about Braveheart, you know, that popular movie and how much right. people love Braveheart, I'm like, you couldn't be fucking Braveheart if your life depended on it, man or woman is what I see in the world. And so I, I you can hear my exasperation. I have just seen so, <laughs> I, DeBerry, I've just been through so much shit because of who I am. And for years, I just made myself wrong about this. You right. know, like, oh, it must be me. I just, 
you know, but, but everyone around would be like, no, it's, it's not you, Beth. It's just that you happen to see what's going on. And as a result, you won't let people get away with it. And I'll finish with this because I have another question for you. The other piece of it for me is that I relate to people on a soul level. And so I've made a commitment to deal with people on a soul level. You know what I mean? So if they're coming at yeah. me with their fakey, fakey stuff, I'm like, you so I wonder what you yeah. think about that and what you've observed with your female clients and male clients and what you've seen. Well, for me, just to speak from my own experience as well, growing yeah. up in, a, in a, a culturally, well, I grew up in England in a very reserved, kind of stiff upper lip Jewish family. So white bread, not, not very emotional. My father was, he wasn't like machismo, but he was very like a held back emotionally. So the look I had from my dad was to be like him because I was firstborn, was to be stoic, but also like suppressed and unemotional. And I'm like, that, no way, can't do that. So I went the other way, which is be the nice guy. So I was more, more fluid, more, more flexible. Plus I was bullied in high school, which added to my lack of desire to be macho because I was just, it wasn't fighting against that. The thing was that I discovered is looking back now that I saw there were only two choices, nice guy or bad boy or macho. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When I discovered, I should say, when I was guided to uh, immerse myself in the masculine and feminine conversation back in 2007, I finally figured out the third piece, which was I didn't realize, which is elevated above the both, which is, again, masculinity, because nice guy is suppressed and, un and unable to take on the strength, whereas, this, whereas the macho guy is, is the toughness, not necessarily strength, but toughness without any heart or compassion. Right, I didn't so know there was a third option. Yes, yeah, so that was the thing for me. And we don't teach any of this stuff. I mean, we don't even teach, or some of this recently, you know, we have sex education in high school, but we don't have relationship education in high school or understanding what masculine and feminine priority is. So our culture is lacking the education period. period. At the same time, people, are, people are, uh, <laughs> are blindly stumbling from relationship to relationship based on what they learned from their parents when they were five years old. Right. That's a whole other piece too. So we're not learning ourselves. And like, you know, back to the title for a second, the painting of a rust idea, is that we don't have the awareness to actually take action to learn what we're doing wrong if we're going to the next relationship. And so we repeat the same cycle again and again. And again, as you said, like women are more open to learning. So women are developing more somewhat, not very fast. Men are not even on the same map at this point because most men are just like, I screwed up. Okay, next. Or she screwed up. What's, what's next? Without going, what can I do differently going forward? Yeah, I think you're so right about this. I do think there is this addiction to, well, I'll just find another person. Yeah. So let me ask you, I want, I want to go through these stages of, so, of the, the painting <laughs> over the rust. So yes. what, what, Barry, what are some of the symptoms or signs or ways people go about the rebound? So they're, 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 they've left a relationship. They're not stopping to go, hmm, why does this keep happening? What's my part? Maybe I need some Barry love doctor support. Uh, right. And they go into this other thing. So what, what are some of the behaviors you see that are dysfunctional when people end relationships? Well, first of all, they hate being single. Being oh, alone okay. is somehow the end of the world. They can't do it. Being alone, they've failed. I mean, especially once you get past 30, 40 years old, there's something right, if you're, if you're alone, there's something wrong with you because you should be, mm. you, you should be, you know, together with somebody. So right. the fear of being alone gets stops people staying in that place of being alone. They're like, okay, that one's done. Let me find the next relationship quickly. And some people literally go a few weeks between relationships and they don't take time to stop. So that's one thing is they're not even willing to trust themselves being single. Um, another one is that oftentimes the breakup, the pain is something they're not willing to actually dive into because it's too much pain. Uh -huh, so rather than uh -huh, that, uh -huh. they'll look for the band-aid of the next relationship, which is kind of yeah. a band-aid. Yeah. So it's avoidance of the pain. And so a lot of times what people are doing is that they are backing away from what didn't work into the next relationship over their shoulder without really looking where they're going. So their mm -hmm. choices aren't really working out either. The third piece, or third or fourth, one of those pieces, is oftentimes what people do, and I did this myself, is that we'll go into the next relationship and have exactly the same thing happen that happened in the last relationship and don't realize it until too late. Yeah. And that is, uh, this I talk back to, go back to our childhood because we don't, again, we're not raised in schools to learn how the relationships work. And what happens is we learn, by example, when we're very young, our parents model to us or a caregiver model to us how love is expressed, good, bad, or indifferent. And we take that in at a very young age without any conscious volition. We just take it and go, well, that's the way it is because we're learning from the, you know, from zero to five years old mm -hmm. without any understanding of what life is about. We go, well, that must be the way it is. Then we have volition show up and we start to decide what we're choosing. 
but we've already stored five years worth or more of understanding behind that gate, so to speak, of the way life is. So as an adult, and many of my clients have seen this, I've seen it myself, we tend to date people, especially in our uh, 20s and beyond, that mirror the relationship patterns our parents had. Yeah. Because we don't learn independently of that how to be in a relationship. And then we wonder why the relationship gets going the same path. Now, some people, very few, had amazing parents who taught them mm-hmm. what to love effectively and properly and healthily and all those things, and they have no problem in relationship. But what most of us do is we tend to find someone with reciprocating reciprocal patterns that fit together with us. Yeah. So that we end up repeating the same pattern, whether it was addiction or abandonment or abuse or yelling or suppression, whatever it was that our parents demonstrated to us, we copy the same thing as an adult. And so I say that a lot of us carry our relationship patterns as a hereditarily, it's a hereditary learned behavior, not a hereditary genetic pattern. So what our parents did, they learned from their parents and beyond. So we may be carrying down generational patterns because we were demonstrated to, they, they demonstrate, excuse me, they demonstrate to us what doesn't work. Let's just say the way it works, which doesn't work, but we don't know differently. We just carried on to our adult life. So for many people, when we start looking back and go, do we really want to keep doing that? You got to find where mm. it started, which is with our parents. Yeah, I in in on both sides of my family, the majority of men were philandering drunkards. And so I have dated a wide assortment of philandering addicts. Yeah. And one of my coaches gave me this great mantra to help me not get into rebound when I have broken up from these relationships. And, uh, you know, for full disclosure, I am single and it's not for lack of trying. Believe me, I have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on relationship <laughs> coaching, therapy. It, these cycles are hard to break. And one of my counselors said to me, Beth, here's your mantra going forward, this is what you have to screen for. Is he an addict? Is he emotionally available? Is he asking to be in a relationship? Those three things. And so just that is giving me like a baseline criteria. Like I didn't really ever learn to screen for criteria. I would just think, oh, I like this person. They showed up in my path. It's synchronicity. It must be meant to be. Let's just go with the flow, man. You know, let's just go with the flow. And then I go with the flow. And yeah, six months, eight months, a year in, I'm like, oh, God, really? You know, because they put a good front up for a while. So they can't they can't hide it anymore. And then I'm like, oh, God. And you're not alone. This is not unusual. No, no. And but I'm not codependent. So the minute I see it, I'm like, OK, I got to go. I can't. <laughs> I don't have any patience with it. So, yeah. All right. That sounds like my experience. It sounds like your experience. It sounds like the experience of 90% of humanity, best I can tell, because from my research, it looks like only about 10% of people are actually truly secure. And they're usually with each other. They're with each other, secure people, right? So we actually, because we're energetic, we're always putting out a frequency and it's always being mirrored. And so what what I recognize after the last one, I was like, this is not happening again which means I have to rewire my infant psyche, like from zero to three. And this has not been easy. This is shadow work, Mm -hmm. right? When people talk about shadow work. So will you share with our listeners? um, Will you share? I was just looking at the time. We're good. Will you share with our listeners what you do to help your divine feminine clients? First of all, um, the first question is, how do you help them get out of the rebound? Like what's, what, what are some of the steps that you take w- with them in the coaching to help them get out? Well, first of all, I tell them to stop. Yeah, <laughs> that's very direct. <laughs> Knock it off. Yeah. I was yeah. like, just stop where you are. Just because, because for many people, uh, we, all, we do this sometimes. We don't even look at the ground we're standing on. We're like, next, next, right. next. Right. So I right. Just stop and just see where you are. What's right. going on? Can you be with what's going on? So a lot of times it's the avoidance of the, what is perceived upset inside that we're trying to avoid to get into the next relationship. So Oftentimes with my clients, it's like, and frankly, most of the time they come to me is because they've stopped and go, oh, I don't know how to deal with this. Let me get some help, which is wise on their part. So then we start talking about, okay, what's in the way? But the thing is, this thread that we're talking about with the past relationship is to look back at the past relationships, plural, and notice the common threads, because that's going to be the clues. There'll be the little, like the red flags going, oh, hang on that one again. Oh, that mm-hmm. thread. And then be honest with yourself. Say, what do I remember from my childhood? What were my parents doing? How are they expressing that I didn't n- until now look at clearly and see if they match because they will. And so that 
you know, the philandering you were talking about, for example, or the addiction, you look back in the parents and it may not be the same addiction or the same methodology, but the same threads are there. Yeah, and, the behavioral patterns. Right. So when you look back at those parts, I, from my background, in, in my counseling background, I talk about a lot with basically reparenting. So really what we're doing is to, and it, I mean, it, it is shadow, but for me, it's actually, it's more, in a way, it's more light because it's about bringing light to the child, it's being, becoming, bringing safety to the inner child. Mm -hmm. So that the inner child becomes re-educated in a way, but by invitation, not by force. So that way it becomes a healthier relationship. So that part of ourselves actually starts to live more fully inside ourselves with a much more aligned and positive experience. So that mm -hmm. becomes part of the journey. And then I, a little, I've done a lot of what, we call, what are called parts integration, which basically bring all the different aspects together because we are a bunch of parts flying around sometimes, <laughs> not talking to yes, each other. Yes, we are. We really so are. It's like, so it's like, let's have a conversation. Let's bring everybody around. I remember once when I was in a seminar talking about this, when I was a participant, I end up with like I end up having like the uh, the nights around table like a Camelot feeling because there's so many different voices going on inside. Like let's come around to a table and talk, and it became hysterically funny because I knew what was going on, but I let these little, these parts of myself just talk back at me, and it was such an interesting conversation because I recognized these are my voices, these are who I am mm. in different parts of my life, and so it's like okay, let's get everybody to get on the same page, and it. <laughs> At times it was like frustrating, but I look back now with amusement, just going how silly that was because I'd recognize that who I am, especially now, is so much more relaxed about life because of, I'm not fighting against myself. Because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of us do that. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So what is, that's great. What What is uh, one of the nuanced shifts that a client shared with you when they finally found a good, healthy relationship in the process of working with you? What what did they maybe notice they were doing differently or feeling differently that had signaled the pattern had shifted? Well, this is one of my overt ones that I like talking about, which is I talk about self-love a lot, self-relationship. And one of my clients, especially, and this happened more than one time, but one of my clients, when she started recognizing that she didn't need somebody outside her to make her feel good, because that was the wiring she had, which many of us do. When she started recognizing that she enjoyed her own company finally for the first time, when she was in her 40s at the time, where she just enjoyed being with herself. And she had a daughter who had, I throw at that time, yeah, she was late 40s. She had a granddaughter just been born. So she was very devoted to the granddaughter, but she was yeah. also pulling away from herself because she wasn't taking care of herself. Right. But this relationship was always, was her, it was the painful safety net for her. She wasn't working. So what I was helping her do was disengage because she wanted to leave, but she didn't know how. But I learned by helping her to love herself, she started recognizing how much value she had just looking inside. Mm. And so the self-love was really the, the shift that she needed. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. You know, I, I recognize for myself similarly, but different that the, the pattern that I was stuck in was looking for validation. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even realize until I said to myself, why am I looking in particular to men I find sexy to validate me? This is weird. I can validate myself. And it was right. such a massive epiphany. I just started validating myself every morning and every night and in my journal and throughout the day. And I, and I did, I felt like this weight lift off of me because I was in a compulsive seeking of validation, not even realizing unconsciously that's what I was hoping for, which made me a mark for people that poured on the charm and the compliments to this old Leo here because- you know, we're suckers for compliments. We Leos, it's true. We're weak that way. We're weak. We're weak for flattery. I know that about myself. Vain and weak for flattery. It's the shadow. And I was like, oh, okay. How do I validate myself? And then that created, I sort of created my own recovery program to, <laughs> right, to validate. So I love that you're saying this about self-love. So will you share with everyone, and then we'll look at your design. Will you share with everyone what Barry's take on self-love is? How do you define it? It's funny because uh, the day after, after Valentine's Day is supposed to be self uh, singles awareness day. They call it. I'm like, you mean you got to be aware you're single? So I call no. it I call it I call it self appreciation day. That's much better. Yeah, singles awareness so, day. It sounds I'm, like a I'm disease. Unfortunately, the acronyms like it's SAD. Sad. I'm like it's not. It is sad. So I call it self appreciation. <laughs> right. So 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 my folks, my clients, is really building self appreciation, um, self esteem, self trust. I mean, a lot of self things. Because self-love is the, the, is the is the little knot on the top of the package, but the package mm -hmm. includes you know, self-forgiveness, self-trust, self-esteem, self-support, all these different things we have, we build for ourselves. So depending where somebody is, it's like where they're, where they're not 
align with themselves, help them come back into alignment so they feel fully self-supportive. Because, you know, we can say, like, put my hand over my heart and say, I love myself. But like, yes, and what about the judgments you carry about what you didn't do in the past? And what are you dealing with past relationship issues or stuff you haven't accomplished yet? What, are, what How do you deal with that? Are you accepting what's going on? Are you loving yourself? Do you trust your own agreements? Mm-hmm. You know, it's all these mm-hmm. components. Yeah. Self-worth is in there too, but worthiness is one of those things that's such an interesting fallacy because worthiness is not something we have to get. It's who we already are, but we forget. So. Yeah, yeah, it's true. You know, and I, I, self worth was never really my issue. You know, people would say to me, "Oh, it's your self worth." I'm like, no, oh. no, it's it's a bad habit. I'm in a bad habit. I do think some people have low self worth. Absolutely, there's certainly people that have terrible boundaries and they put up with the worst nonsense from people um, because right. of their low self worth. But it seems to me like like you said, whatever the patterns were from early childhood until they become conscious, we can't really unravel them. Like I found out in my therapy that I had made a decision to fix things for my mother. And I had made this decision when I was 18 months old. And then I just tried to imagine the conflict and dynamic between my mother and my father when I was 18 months old. And it wasn't that great. Like from what both of them have told me about their maturity level and what they were doing in their own lives, I, I, I thought, oh, wow. And, I, and the little child is just absorbing their anxiety, their angst, right? They're, and, and both of them were very kind of self-centered and, you know, they, they were young. They, they're just, their attention was on themselves and yeah. their own concerns. And I'm a very uh, social, tactile, affectionate person right. who needs a lot. I'm an extrovert. I need a lot of human contact. And I had two parents that were off, you know, just doing whatever. And I think just that was, it was very traumatic. When you work with someone, what, can you walk us through the process you take someone through when you work with a client? Well, it, it's, it's different for every client. So I don't exactly right. have a fixed path. But, but it, just it, kind of the process, you know, right. the steps. Yeah. First of all, it's about navig- finding out where they are really now. Like getting clear about what's, what's, it, what's happening, where they are, what's, ha- what's caused the most recent challenge, trauma, upset, hurt feelings. Then we go back to like resolve that and then start looking at the threads. Because again, building... A framework of what's really going on to know what needs to be fixed is the first pe- pass because awareness is the usual the first step. If it requires going back to childhood to realign patterns, we'll do that. But it's really to, like using the analogy of the paint over rust, is to finally strip off and clean off the rust once and for all back to bare metal so it's actually clean again. Because mm. most of us keep accumulating more and more junk on top of who we are. Um, one of my one of the people I remember talking to, Barbara DeAngelis, who used to do uh, Making Love Work, she was um, married to John Gray way back when. She was doing a lecture several years ago, and she said about the challenge, if we don't deal with our past stuff, we don't heal our past emotional wounds, and we go out and date somebody again, we imagine that basically we have this sea or this ocean of love that we have to express. But when we don't heal stuff, it's like we're putting ice on top of the ocean. A slow bit surely, we're filling up the top of the ocean. And the ocean is the love we get to express. And the more we cover it up, the less we can give. So our relationships we go into, if we don't heal those past emotional upsets, wounds, hurt feelings, heartbreaks, we're just simply covering up more and more of the love we can give. Mm. So we can only be so loving to the amount of wounds we haven't healed. So the more we do the healing work, the more loving we can be for ourselves and then somebody else. So it's all in that mix that I work with my clients to basically become more available to the love they have themselves. So they can express it to themselves and somebody else. It's beautiful. Do you think that maybe we're moving more into a love frequency because there's just been such an overemphasis on material acquisition and money and and we're just hungry for heart connection and love the hunger definitely is real Um, i think people are starving yeah the challenge is that because we are needing it more and more there's more i think more againstness showing up in the way of that first it's like the it's like the the like the more the light that comes on the planet, the more darkness gets constrained, like big zits that we're bursting. <laughs> it's a good way of putting it. Yes. So those expressions of againstness and division and divisiveness, I, I like to think, and I hope to think that it's kind of the last vestiges of the true um, emptiness that we've been, we've been avoiding, we've been fighting with for so many years, because really there is more and more light coming on, but, uh, but I'm really focused on how we can have what I'll call more functional love, more, more relational love, more, more community love where we can actually mm-hmm. be more in alignment to have discussion versus argument, where we can actually have progress versus stumbling and, and yeah. ourselves, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's possible. We're not there yet, but we're working towards it. 
Well, as people learn to love themselves, they naturally become more self-respecting and then they're able to extend that respect to others and recognize that other people are different. They have different experiences, different feelings, different thoughts, different opinions, and all is valid and welcome. Because most of the division happening now in the different countries, including the United States, is from a very immature and, and, and ignorant place. That's juvenile grow, at best. Yeah. Yes, the more we grow and learn to love and be compassionate, somebody who has an opposite view, we start seeing that's not them, that's the view they have, and we can talk about that. And when right. we both have maturity, we can actually find middle ground. Yeah. What a concept. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Barry. Well, let's let's have a look at your chart before we wrap up. Sure. Was there was there anything you wanted to explore today? Hmm. I'm kind of open to all of it i mean i i, I know okay. that my throat's been doing a lot of work more recently because i found that that's become my strength to communicate and spread speak, yeah so you are a good there. speaker all right let's start with speaking okay cool good good all right do you see your chart yes i do okay wonderful all right so you are a manifesting generator and the reason for this is you have this solar plexus here that it connects into your sacral, which is the sex chakra. And then the, this goes up through the 2946 to the G center, and then the one eight up to the throat. And then it, your throat connects up to your Ajna. So you have a wonderful thing in your design. I think it's wonderful. It's called single definition. And it's interesting yes. because it's not the most well-suited to partnership, a single definition, not in a traditional sense. You know, so it's like you've got to be real flexible about your definition of relationship and and you probably do well with someone else that needs a ton of freedom because there's so much need for alone time in this design of yours to research and to study and to be with your creativity and do your writing and all that good stuff. And yet you are a very sensual sexual person i'm wondering do you know not everyone is i look at some people's charts and i even ask them how do you feel about sex and they're like no um but you've got a lot of warmth to you and i'll show you where so you've got the mating channel and then you have the um 46 29 channel i'm blanking on the name of the channel but it's essentially about the love of the body and being devoted to taking care of your body because your body, when it's loved and you love your body, it, it tends to take you to the right places at the right time. And mm -hmm. good fortune is very much about how we are embodied. It's our embodiment that creates the good fortune. Uh, so you have this, you have the whole embodiment channel and it's a tantra channel. And then you also have uh, half of the other three, of the other two, excuse me, tantra channels. There's three tantra channels in here, when we talk about Tantra, it's about sexuality, it's about the senses. So you've got the mating channel, this love of the body, and then 14 is about loving work and putting sexual energy into your work, the, the, the life force that does work. Right. You, the work may or may not have a sexual you know, theme to it, but it, there's the love of work. And then five is being very disciplined. So there, you, you'll tend to be orderly and rhythmic in how you go about things. You like to have routines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you like to, you like to have some consistency. Um, you also have gate nine, which is about focus. So we've got gate nine, which is focus and gate five, which is routines. So this is gonna give a modicum of regularity to your life. Now, to your throat, let's go to your question. So this is just an overview here, but you're definitely doing the right work. And the left angle cross of dominion is you're here to instill doubt in people about what they think they know, their preconceived ideas. Yep. And then you show them, you teach them a different way. Your core genius is to teach people about partnership. It's gate 45, line two. Line two is about partnership. It's also about being separate. Think of the 11 or the two, you know, the towers. Um, right. the, the uh, one and one adds up to two, obviously, but two can be unified. But, and it can be aligned, but it can also be very divisive. So mm -hmm. the 45 teaches is, is, a, is the king gate. It's the energy of the king. In women, it's the energy of the queen. So your core genius is being the king who helps others 
uh, learn about what it is to be a king and how to attract a king, if that's what they're wanting, um, how to be uh, open to king-like love. And, and I think actually you're on the cutting edge of something here, Barry, because there really aren't that many men at this point in history embodying king energy. You know, most of the leaders of these corporations and countries, if you ask me, are just complete psychopathic sociopaths. I mean, they're narcissistic. It's a nightmare. So I don't think they're kings. I think they're like a lot of them are just, you know, white collar criminals. And, you know, and then you go out on the dating apps and you've got not secure people. Mostly you've got lots of anxious and avoidant types. Right. You know, you have the clingy ones and the runners, the clingers and the runners. So you're coming in. <laughs> with the 45-2 to teach people about the abundance that comes from love. Because I don't even know that most of humanity is aware that it's an open heart that creates prosperity, not a closed, miserly, Scrooge-like heart. It's an open heart. And I think we've forgotten that love is the most important thing in the world. It's everything. And this G-Center, in fact, which is the magnet that holds your body together. So we're basically, we're made up of stardust and heart math, which you might be familiar with, has shown that when people meditate on their heart and they meditate on opening their heart and they meditate on loving more, their body emits more photons, which is more light. So we actually are channeling more light through our body, which is just amazing to me when we love. So your 45 is up here in your design earth, which is the most grounded, instinctive, aspect of you moving through time and space that your body moving through time and space and so you're here to be yeah an educator and you're not meant to do all the work although you're a very good leader this is a leadership gate and the one eight is a leadership channel and you have the gate 31 which is leadership and gate 10 is part of a leadership channel you don't have the other side of it but there's so much leadership in this design um, and, and essentially what you're here to do is influence people to be more creative about how they engage in relationships and to embrace their sexuality, embrace the love of their body. Um, you, all, you, you have so much love energy going on here. I'll just, I, this is what you're here to communicate. So the one eight is pulling, you see how that channel connects to the throat? The eight talks about how we benefit others when we're creative. Uh, how we benefit others by developing ourselves. That's part of the communication there. The 45 is teaching, the 31 is influencing, and then the 4323 channel is the genius channel. And this is an uh, individual energy that empowers people. You don't ever really know when the genius is gonna flow through. You've kind of got to wait for the right timing uh, so that people don't think you're a freak. But when the time is right, it's freak right. to genius, it's called freak to genius channel. Um, yeah. You know, am I a freak today or a genius? I also have this channel. So the, the freak to genius channel is, is, is that you and I, we, we get a lot of information that comes through. And we've got to communicate it. It's just waiting for the right timing. So there's great energy in this chart. There's massive prosperity and money in this chart. You never have to worry about money ever, ever, ever. In fact, if you're worrying about money that will block your money, because this is the chart of someone who's just lucky, 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 lucky. So I don't know if you have any kind of limitations around prosperity, but you're meant to be very, very wealthy. So I would just encourage you to line up with being the king and just start asking, well, what would King Barry do? And where would King Barry live? And what would King Barry drive? And you actually need to be a little bit more superficial or bring in the superficial. Mm -hmm. uh, this is about adornment. 46 is about adornment, but it's unconscious in you. So do you, you know, do you love it? You, do you love it? You are very fashionable so that you got that, you know, like, like yeah. really <laughs> the, when people are, are, are stylish and it comes from self-love, it's really wonderful. Versus, you know, we were talking about earlier, the costume. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, all right, I'll stop here. You go ahead. You go ahead. Well, there's a couple of things on there. That I, I mean, thank you for that. It's like, these I go, oh, I didn't realize that. I recognize that. It was nice to have that confirmation. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because um, I've been single now since 2000, 2006 was my last breakup. So it's been 15 years, 16 years. Wow. And initially I was upset with that. And now I've got these new skills. I want to, like, I want to be in a relationship. And I started dating. It didn't work. But I say for the last at least 10 years, I've been happily single, not needing anybody. And I've been definitely on the dating apps and checking people out. But the, and it's not so much the um, being too selective, just that I'm not really attached to anybody. 
So that no. definitely feels like it's not. You don't get you attached. Down. Yeah. This chart. This um, isn't the design of someone that gets attached, particularly. Just, yeah, it's an interesting dance. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about that. I would love to be doing my work with a partner, doing the work with me in a way that overlaps. Yeah. But I recognize we'd have to walk our own paths separately at the same time as that, which is interesting. So I'm like, yeah, you okay. would. And that. So it would be, yeah, it'd this, be great if you had a relationship coach who had her own business. Yeah. We'd run parallel. Yeah, so you'd, you'd have so much to, in common, but like you live in your own, like, here's the deal with the single definition people. You always need your own space. Even if you share a home, you need like a man cave or a man guest house or a man attic or whatever your jam is, <laughs> but you need a place where like the door's padlocked and no one goes in there unless they have permission. And, you know, you've got your own space because you, as a single definition with this much power, you learn things so quickly. The insights come to you so rapidly and you are very, very self-sufficient. You're very self-contained in this design. So your need for the other isn't there. Whereas my, my centers aren't all connected. It's called split definition. Split definition are about 50% of the population. And those of us that are split are happiest in a partnership. We feel we can relax because somebody bridges the split. And, and when we're with that person, all of our energy can connect. So there's this fe mm -hmm. feeling of peace and homecoming, right? Whereas for you, the other can't do that for you. So the other person has to be a tremendous compliment to your life and someone you just really enjoy being with, or what's the point? Because you exactly. figure everything out yourself anyways. It is, it is a curse and a pleasure at the same time. <laughs> right, well, and, I, and I do, you know, I finally realized in my chart, like I should not ever live with someone and I am very independent. I have been my whole life. I mean, from the age of 13, I'm like, I'm not getting married and having kids. And I did get married and I had stepkids and I ended up divorced and it was a nightmare. And I look back, I'm like, I should have stayed true. I knew at 13, I knew I wasn't cut out for traditional roles. I gave it a shot but it just caused me misery. And it's because I need to be alone four or five hours a day just to study. I've been this way since I was eight years old, you know? And so just yeah. owning how we actually are, I think in relationship and not, uh, not being controlled by the status quo, you know, not being controlled by, by the public. So anyway, the public MO. So what would you say to a woman who really wants that partnership? But um, she's given up. She just said, uh, ugh. Well, <laughs> the sarcastic one in me would say, well, you're right. You know, if you're going to give up, you won't get what you want. But the right? truth is, that if you want yeah. to have a busy relationship, then it's really, to, really the, to look at the fact is, are you looking for a relationship because you think you're missing something? Or are you looking for a relationship, to, as like you were saying about myself, it's like finding someone who really makes my life, adds to my life in a way that fits for what I want. Because for many people, they're looking for a relationship from a place of, of lack. I mean, most of us right. are, you know, Jerry Maguire's quote, you complete me. They're in that mindset still, the codependent paradigm where when that person shows up, I'll be happy. Like, no, be happy, right. let then the person can show up. Right, right. So it's, it's that rewiring that with my, especially my clients, I mean, I had to do it myself. Now, of course, it's easy. Is that I feel whole as I am. I mean, my clients are fully supporting themselves and fully vested in who they are then a relationship is easier to find because they're being more magnetic and also being more visible to that relationship. Yeah. So it starts inside. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, sometimes I find that people, even people not in a relationship can be very good teachers of relationship in part because all of that time alone has helped you to know yourself so well mm -hmm. and really understand relationship dynamics. And also I would just say to you, I'd say, give yourself a pass because the kind of intimacy that's going to work for you is not traditional. And it certainly isn't having someone around you all the time. It's like you come together and it's lovely and then you both go away and then you come together and you go away. And even a long distance relationship for you, or even if you wanted to date multiple people, if they were all keen on it, it's, it, you could do that because, because you don't attach the way I attach. I mean, if someone bridges my split, it does, they do complete me. They actually complete the circuit. So I right. can actually access parts of me. I can't access on my own. Whereas for you, you can access most of yourself without another person. And that is a big difference between people. Okay. It's a really big, isn't <laughs> that it's a huge deal. 
Well, I, I wasn't yeah. trying to correct you. I, I, I think I, I think no, no, I was just agreeing with what you were saying earlier. But you just need a very unconventional kind of setup. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not. I definitely feel monogamy is my preference. Yeah, uh, if you're drawn to multiple partners, right. one is right. just to be honest, it's too much to keep track of. Right, right. Too much, <laughs> too many, too many stories to explain to too many yeah. people. So, so one person who's in that place that fits that would be perfect. Yeah, I feel the same way. I just don't. I don't. I can't be bothered. Like, ugh. Right. plus, I, I very much like to get to know a person, right, and be intimate with them. And yeah, I don't share well. I'm sure it's the Leo thing too. I mean, I. I'm not excessively jealous, but if someone if someone isn't like clean with me, then I'll get jealous. But then their their history, because right. um, I'm not going to do that. But uh, <laughs> any final words of wisdom for our audience? I was going to say we all deserve a relationship, and then I'm like, Mark, we just talked about my chart. It's not about necessarily deserving; it's about preference. But it's, it was, but it's being it, aligned yeah. to it, being aligned to your true values, and and it is okay not to match everybody else. That I do know. Yeah, it's about being you. Yeah. And, and 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 trusting the way you're wired and then creating a life accordingly and we are all quite different we really yeah, are quite different well this has been wonderful everyone listening or watching go to barryselby.com and take advantage of barry's free resources and get in his community barry this has been awesome i would love to have you back i feel like we could talk for hours I had I to like bite my tongue because I wanted you to talk <laughs> and I, but I got, I get so excited. I get so riled up about this subject matter because I've, yeah. I've seen so much of it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Oh, uh, I've learned so much about relating over my many years of, uh, but any final words for our audience? Well, put it this way. Love is a joyful thing to have and do it for yourself first. That's I always recommended that. So do the work to find your own way back to yourself because we are the best relationship we have in the first place. Yeah, we are. Yeah. I think I read, recently that men will tend to choose for a long-term partner someone that loves themselves more than they love the partner and and i think that's very important you have to love yourself yeah. the most yes right you do it's one, it's one relationship you spend your whole life with that's right you better love yourself <laughs> well thank you barry and uh thank, thank you me. everyone for for another uh wonderful episode of align to your design we'll see you very soon bye for now bye you enjoyed this episode of Align to Your Design? If you did, please grab my free report, Business by Design, at yourpurpose.com and then join our Facebook group, Align to Your Design. See you next time.